our real world leaders with us today. And I want to introduce Virginia Cassell. Uh, marketing department, 
And I hope you can have the opportunity to see the wedding dresses that are in there that are made from uh, parachute material. Um, one lady, I love her story, the short, the short blue dress was a lady uh, named Tula Kirkendall. And Tula wanted to get married while her husband was on leave. And Tula was working in a parachute factory, and she could not find any material to make a dress. And it was, you know, post-depression time. So for six years, she got together this, these remnants of this blue parachute material and made that little sheath dress. The part her daughter, Linda Wagner, told me that happened after that, she had to go back home and sell a cow so she could get gasoline to meet her, her husband. To be. They had to go across three states to get married because she was underage in many of them. They had a flat tire and they made it back to work because we're finding that these women really live like military men. If you miss work, if you are ill, you were fired, you were gone. So she was able to accomplish that. The other wedding dress was a post-World War II wedding dress by Betty Burley, who again took her parachute material and made this uh, dress for herself. Okay, some of you have a bell, right? And um, there's been an effort to all across the nation and internationally to set a certain day and a certain time that everybody should ring a bell for roses. Well, we're not really in that time zone. <laughs> but I would like very much for us to practice because you are going to be doing this bell ringing at certain times in our presentation today. So let's, I know they're little, so let's give it a try and let me hear those bells. Oh, yes, you're very similar. Okay. This is gone now. You have to be awake, ready, and alert when the time comes to the bell. If you need one, and we have a few extra Julie right there can just hear it. Okay. Let's see. Okay. We do have some special guests today, and we want to extend a welcome to you. And the first, I want to introduce Mr. Lynn Phillips. He is the area representative for Governor Jim Justice. Justice who couldn't attend this afternoon. The Governor Justice would like to extend his thank you to our town for putting this together and honoring all of our Rosie Derivators. And also he'd like to say a special thank you to you, Virginia, for the work and what you provided during our service years of World War II. And he would like to say thank you. Uh, Governor Justice again couldn't be with us, but he has sent readings which I'd like to read to everyone now. As governor of the great state of West Virginia, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the third annual Rosie Derivator celebration in Randolph County. Today we are honored the women of Randolph County who proudly served on the home front during World War II. These women worked and volunteered on the assembly lines, farms, shipyards, airplane factories, and many other institutions to support the battles overseas. They also worked with the USO, or Red Cross, ensuring our brave troops were cared for as much as possible. Rosie the Riveter first began as a song inspired by war worker Rosalind Walter, now Rosie the Riveter, and is seen as a symbol of reminding us all of the 16 million women who watched over our country during World War II. Today we induct five new Rosies and it is fitting to recognize and preserve the history of working women including volunteer women during World War II as we strive to promote patriotic ideas in the workplace and foster loyalty to the United States of America, let us take this moment to celebrate the remarkable contributions of these Rosies. On behalf of the citizens of the Mountain State, I would like to extend my congratulations to the inductees of the newest Rosies who are being represented by their families today, and I wish everyone the best. Sincerely, Jim Justice, Governor. Thank you. Well, we're fortunate to 
to have this beautiful surrounding to be here today, both outside and inside, the preservation of this beautiful building. And for Davis and Elman College hosting us here. So I would like to call to the front uh, Dr. Rosemary Thomas, who is the Executive Vice President of this institution. Thank you. fabulous event together and your attendance here shows your support and your belief in what it is that we are celebrating here today. On behalf of President Chris Wood and all of Davis and Elkins College, I welcome you and I hope that you will enjoy your stay here and not be a stranger. There's so much history here on this campus and that's what you're celebrating is history. I'm going to take a couple moments and points of privilege because I'd like to tell you just a little tiny bit about d and &E and you'll understand why. <coughs> You know, there have been some struggles in higher education, not too far from us, as you can imagine. Our goal for our freshman class this year was to bring in 240 new students. And I'm very pleased to say that we're bringing in over 300 new students. bring that to your attention is because it was done by an entire group of made up of women. Women professionals here at this institution led by some of the finest ladies you will ever meet. And on the day that they made their goal and passed it, which was a while ago, I gave them a keychain that said something. May you be proud of the work that you do, the person you are, and the difference that you make. I would like to present this to Virginia today. Thank you. Davis Elkins College has another what I would consider point of pride, and that's because I wear a different hat or a different bandana, as the case may be, which is why I wear the poppy today. We wear the poppy so we will never forget. This is part of my role as the executive director of Rhododendron Girls State which is hosted and housed right here at Davis and Elkins College. We celebrate all of our veterans. We celebrate the Rosie the Riveters. We celebrate the difference that everyone makes. Quite frankly, we all know that some organizations and some groups are trying to silence history, aren't they? Yeah. That is not what we stand for, and that is certainly not what Elkins stands for. The sticker that I was given that I love our town, that's part of the reason I love it. And that's part of the reason that I love being part of Davis and Elkins College. I want to read you our mission statement quite quickly, and it simply says this, to prepare and inspire students for success and for thoughtful engagement in the world. Let's replace that word and simply say, to prepare and inspire people for success and for thoughtful engagement in the world. That is what our Rosies have done. That is what our town does. And that is the legacy that Davis and Elkins College and the senators that I like to say are the ones that get work done. The senators <laughs> will continue to carry on with our record size freshman class. And we look forward to seeing you all again and again. Celebrate big, Rosie, and ring those bells. Thank you. That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Very Thank good. you so very much, ladies. <laughs> Last but not least, let me introduce Becky Marks, who is representing Lavender Fields and is one of our co sponsors for today. Becky? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I just wanted to come up and say thank you to the Outtown group who did an amazing job pulling this whole thing together. and. You know, just let you know that we kind of got involved because we have a Rosie at our facility. And honestly, that's when we really knew about this group and this program. And we just are so proud of all the work that all the Rosies have done over the years. And we just feel like they definitely need recognized. And, you know, that's kind of just why we wanted to be a part of this program this year. And I just thank you guys for allowing us to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Facility. 
and she wasn't able to come today. But they take good care of her there. We got to visit with her on her 99th birthday, and uh, she has great rosy stories to tell. Let us continue by opening the section of our real presentation by the presentation of colors by the scouts. I know they've been waiting back there patiently. Thank you very much. I think it says in your program that we're going to bring the flags out. This is Girl Scout Group 10142 under the direction of Ruth Ann Talbot. Uh, if you're able to stand during the presentation of colors and the pledge and the Star Spangled Banner, we appreciate that. If not, that's okay. You will be with us on the so part of the
were leaving the safety or the comfort of home or the farm or wherever they were to go somewhere new and unusual, maybe a little scary, but exciting. And that's what many of the stories say. Well, we have our storyteller today, Becky Ashburn, is going to tell us her vision of the Rosie story. I'm glad to see everybody. I'm representing Rosie. I I, uh, I wasn't one. I'm not related to one, as far as I know. But I am a fan of history and of acknowledging women's parts in history, which has sort of been lost in the shuffle for a while. I want to tell you, first of all, where the idea of Rosie the River that term, where that came from, and then I want to talk about something of what it was like to be a Rosie. First of all, there was a song, which I think has been referred to here this morning. It was uh, written in 1942 by a couple of guys, based on, as our message from the governor referred, I was pleased that he knew that, based on a particular woman who went into a factory to work. And her name is Rosalind Palmer. Um, and so out of the name Rosalind came Rosie. Uh, her beloved man was, had joined the fight, and he was a fighter pilot. So she went to work at the nearest airplane factory that she could find that was making Corsair fighter planes. And she worked the night shift to make planes for her beloved to fly. And that story, she was from Long Island on the fringes of New York society, you know, big deal. And it made the news, and these two guys in New York City writing popular songs heard about Rosie. And so they wrote this song. And maybe you already have the lyrics in your head. I did not. And so I want to read you what the song Rosie the Riveter says which started a whole marketing, publicity, naming campaign that women became Rosie. While other girls attend their favorite cocktail bar, sipping dried martinis, munching caviar, there's a girl who's really putting them to shame. Rosie is her name. All day long, it should say tonight. All day long, whether rain or shine, she's a part of the assembly line. She's making history, working for victory. Rosie, the river. Keeps a sharp lookout for sabotage, sitting up there on the fuselage. That little frail can do more than a male can do. Rosie, the river. Rosie's got a boyfriend, Charlie. A lot of men in World War II were called Charlie. Her boyfriend's name is actually him. <laughs> Rosie's got a boyfriend, Charlie. Charlie, he's a Marine. Rosie is protecting Charlie, working overtime on the riveting machine. When they gave her a production E, I may get around to telling you what that is, she was as proud as a girl could be. There's something true about red, white, and blue about Rosie the River. Rosie the River. Everyone stops to admire the scene. Rosie at work on the B-19. They had to make it run. It was actually a Corsair. <laughs> She's never twittery, never nervous or jittery, Rosie, the rib riveter. What if she smeared full of oil and grease, doing her bit for the old and least? She keeps the gang around. They love to hang around, Rosie, the riveter. Rosie buys a lot of war bonds. That the girl really has sense. Wishes she could purchase more bonds, putting all her cash into national defense. Senator Jones, who's in the know, shouted these words on the radio. Berlin will hear about. Moscow, Russia was our ally at that point. We were in the war together back then. Berlin will hear about. Moscow will cheer about. Rosie, the river. Rosie. The river. Well, so all the women who went into war work sort of got titled mm -hmm. that name because the song became so popular. And then a while later, the most famous illustrator in the United States, Norman Rockwell, mm -hmm. doing a cover as he did very often for the Saturday Evening Post, 
did one, um, it, it came out, the song came out in March and his painting came out in May. So he, it didn't take him too long. And he, he did this painting, this is her rivet done across her lap. And she's got her lunchbox there and I had mine. And Norman Rockwell made sure you knew who this girl was. He wasn't shy about using Rosie as a name for her um, since the song was so popular. So this painting went out on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post to over 4 million American households. And then the painting went on tour all around the country. Um, and Rosie the Riveter became a very famous image uh, of this young woman. She, this was Norman Rockwell's neighbor. She was 19 years old, 120 pound telephone operator. Little tiny girl. And Norman Rockwell apologized to her later for making her look so huge. Because <laughs> she was really a tiny little thing. Uh, but he said, the work that American women are doing is so enormous, she needs to look like a giant. Because their work is so enormous. So he apologized for making her look bigger. I mean, women didn't want to do that. Um, she got $10 and uh, her name is Rose, uh, Rose Doyle and she loved for the rest of her life to be connected with this image which became uh, what do you call those things an icon an icon in America uh, this is what the women working in World War II became to look like in the minds of the American people so this is Rosie the Riveter. So those two things made the idea, the name, Rosie the Riveter, popular. The song and then Norman Rockwell's painting. Now later on came the one that's on your badges, that we can do it. And that is Naomi. It took her until she was 95 to be correctly identified as the model for that we can do it. She had tried to say to people for years that, that she was that. Uh, but somebody else got the credit for it for a while. But Naomi uh, Fraley actually is the model for this. She ran a turret lathe. That's a hard thing to say when you're talking in front of a lot of people. A tur turret lathe in an airplane factory. Um, she was not a riveter. She was a lady worker. Um, and her picture was distributed in newspapers. This tall, slender woman running this lathe making turrets for airplanes. She got fan mail. Um, and so the J. Howard Miller, who was the um, the advertising guy for Pittsburgh Westinghouse plant got on to her and used her as the model for a, a sort of incentive poster. He did 47 of these incentive posters that were up for two weeks at a time in the Westinghouse factory in Pittsburgh to say to people, come on, let's keep it going. Because there were men working there too and women and just come on y'all. We got it. We can do it. They were making helmet liners. Um, when, when, when there's a lot of heat in the Pacific and when there's a lot of concussion from armaments blasting off all around you, you don't want a metal helmet that's going to be crashing your brain. We know about concussions and how dangerous they are. And Westinghouse had this material they had been using for a long time for insulation, for refrigerators and for telephone lines. And they found out that since it would, would insulate from, from, um, from, from noise and from vibration and from cold and heat, that it would work very well as helmet liners. So the women at the West and the men at the Westinghouse factory in Pittsburgh find <coughs> millions of helmets. And it's not rocket science. You line one helmet, 
and you line the next helmet, and you line the next helmet, and you line the next helmet. You line millions of them. And so after a while, you know how careful are you? How fast are you? How, how much attention are you paying? And so they needed these incentive morale boosting posters all over the, the plant. So J. Howard Miller would do a new poster every couple of weeks. So we can do it went up for two weeks and that was the end of it. Until decades later, some women got onto this and they said, that's us. And the women's movement and other women trying to get recognition for all that they've been doing all these years got onto that image. But she was never Rosie. She was never associated with the name Rosie. She was never part of the Rosie the Riveter thing. She was just two weeks in one Westinghouse factory, and then she was put in the basement with all those other posters. So she's not really rosy, but she is the image, the primary image that a lot of women have now, rather than the Norman Rockwell. It's interesting how one has sort of taken the place of the other. But this is Rosie. Her name is on the, on the lunchbox. <laughs> okay. Just trying to set the record straight. All right. So you know already, in the fall, the autumn of 1941, America was not interested at all in war over there. That was their business. We had enough to take care of over here trying to come out of the Depression. 25% of Americans were unemployed. People had lost their houses. The farms had blown away in the dust bowl, and it was awful. And we had all we could handle right here. But then, that was the fall of 1941. On December 7, 1941, when the Japanese bombed our fleet at Pearl Harbor, our Pacific fleet, at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, all of a sudden, we were hot to try. And so, men signed up by the millions, I guess, hundreds of thousands at least, and then they instituted the draft, and men responded to the call to, to be, to go in uh, following the draft. And, and so, jobs became available. Um, but you know, the, the, the men went off to learn how to be soldiers. But we know that it's not just men, not just people, that make it possible to fight a war. Men gotta have uniforms, they gotta have those helmets, they gotta have boots, they gotta have tents, they gotta have cots, they gotta have blankets, they gotta have medical care, they gotta have a way to get from here to there, they gotta have trains that run, they gotta have, and then once they get trained here, they gotta get over to Europe where the fighting is, and they gotta have ships, and they gotta have airplanes, and when they get over there to fight, they gotta have tanks, and they gotta have jeeps, and they gotta have trucks, and they gotta have, you know? It takes all that stuff to make a war. And with the men gone, who's gonna make the stuff? Us. <laughs> Us, the women of America. And we jumped to it. Some of us, were middle-aged housewives. We were considered older workers if we were over 35. Uh, some of us were, uh, but you know, us older middle-aged housewives, our husbands mostly had never wanted us to go out to work. So we had never had a paycheck, but we, you think being a woman and running a house is not work? Yeah. You think that's not? Um, uh, I'm not trying to start fighting. We've had our war. Um, some of us Rosies were young women who wanted to get off the farm or were stifled in these small towns. That was all the life we ever expected to have, and this was our chance to get out and live big. Some of us were teenagers who lied about our age to get away, go have an adventure, see what the world was like. Some of us were like Rosie the Riveter. She was working because she had a man she loved over there, and she was going to do what she could for her man. Some women just went, they'd seen all these advertisements and posters and commercials on the radio and at the movies about when the men are over there, 
you need to get it done over here. And, you know, sign up, do your part. And so women responded to the advertising and the promotions of go do your bit. Some women uh, uh, did it for just they wanted a chance to prove what they could do. These production jobs that men had always had, not women, see, they wouldn't let the women have those production jobs, and they'd always paid more than the kinds of jobs that women were allowed to do. And some of these women said, I know I can. Give me a chance, and I'll show you what I can do. And they went at it. And so we learned us, Rose. We weren't just riveters, as somebody has already said. We, and I love that there's a picture in yonder. If you all will look at it, it explains that a riveter also needs a buckle. <coughs> when you shoot a rivet through two pieces of metal to hold them together, there's a head on one end of the rivet, and you shoot that through there and it holds on my end of the metal. I'm shooting it with my rivet gun. But on the other end of the two pieces of metal, if it's just a plain round tube, something's got to happen to hold it or it'll slide right back out. So the bucker has got this steel bar, and she's braced against me and my, my, my rivet gun, and she's going to push against the rivet when it comes through the metal, and then it mashes open the end of it and makes another head that will hold the whole thing in place. If she wasn't back there, when you tried to move the thing, it would just fall out the front. So there's a picture back there of a riveter and her buffer. And in, mostly in California, where in one town in California, there were 35 war plants in one town. And mostly in California, the riveter and bucker partners were one white woman and one African-American woman. And so we Rosies learned, you know, people are people, women are women. Just because your skin is different from mine, or maybe you're Spanish speaking, or you're Asian, or you're from an, an Indian <coughs> reservation, just because you're different from me, and you didn't come from my hometown, and my hometown was all the people I ever knew before. But you know, us women, we're just women. <laughs> Ain't that much difference from you and me. And they began to make the beginnings of some interest in civil rights, which grew a few years later, partly because women began to see each other as women, people. So they weren't just riveters. They were buffers. They were um, whistle pump singers at, at logging woods. They were pipe fitters. They were welders. They were cargo loaders. They were electricians. They were flame cutters. They were, I don't think there's a job you can imagine that they didn't need. Whatever needed to be done in assembly, in production, in transportation, after, during the Depression, hardly anybody had a car anyway, but these women, of course women, were driving. That was too intricate for a woman's brain to manage. So women didn't drive, and then suddenly they've been learning to drive semi-tractor trailers across the country, taking parts and supplies where they needed to go to be shipped out to the war effort over there. And some of them were pilots, they learned to fly the planes that we were assembling in our airplane factories to the training grounds where the men were going to learn to fly them, but the women see already knew how to fly them. Um, <laughs> we were learning things that people had said, I know one can't do that. There, there were, some of us, Rosies, ran cranes moving huge pieces of airplanes and tanks and submarines and ships into place on the assembly line floor from a crane 60 feet above the concrete floor. And the crane ran on tracks. And so you drove the crane along the 
tracks to where you needed to pick up something, and you took it along the track to where it needed to be put so it could be part of the thing you're building. But the tracks would get slippery from just being the, the, the run up and down, up and down, up and down. So at the end of your 10-hour shift, on your hands and knees, you're out there sprinkling sand along the track 60 feet above the concrete factory floor to keep the tracks from being so slick that the crane would fall off the tracks because a crane is too expensive. You can't have a, a crane falling off the tracks. Women need to get another woman. But a crane is expensive. <laughs> And there were men taking bets on the factory floor. She can't go out there and do that. She's going to look down between there and she's going to see what's a she. She's not going to do it. She'll quit tomorrow. Most of us didn't quit. We rose to the challenge. We kept going. By the time the war ended, 50% of us Rosies were women over, married women over 35 who hung in there until it was all over. We were determined to do what needed to be done. And we did. We, we well, some of those jobs, like in the, in the planes assemblies and the train tracks and the loading docks, it was so noisy that we had a headache all the time. But we would, some of us would prefer that kind of job to a very quiet job the tedium, I cannot explain to you, of inspecting one by one millions of bullets. How many bullets do you think our men fired in World War II? And almost every single one of them was inspected by someone sitting at a table, one bullet after another. The tedium, I think, must have been horrific. They, that was before earbuds and you know, you play this. Um, or, there, and there's a picture of that woman that I've read about in the histories of the Rosies. Her job was to drop telephones on the floor, one after the other, to make sure they were sturdy enough to survive in war com conditions, combat conditions. So her job was to drop telephones. How would you like a job dropping telephones? To see if they're going to break. Some of us would prefer to be on that crane six to beat up than drop his telephone all day. <coughs> so we did all kinds of things. Um, and then, when it was all over, and the men came home, we knew that every tank, every gun, every bit of ammunition, Every plane that flew, every submarine that flew, every ship that brought people back and forth or carried men into war along the beaches of Europe, every uniform they wore, every bed they slept in, every tent that they had, every boot they wore, every helmet they put on their head, was because we made it. The men won the war. But they would have had nothing to fight with if we had not dressed them and armed them and gotten them there. We provided everything necessary for the men to win. And they came home to parades, to medals, to ceremonies, to the GI Bill, to to veterans benefits, to health care for the rest of their lives, to being heroes. And we were fired the day the war ended. And told to go home, put on our aprons, and make nice for those men who came back. <laughs> and for a long time, it seemed like the world kind of forgot us. And it was the men who won the war. But we Rosies, I want you to know, what you know. We Rosies never forgot. And 
And now, maybe you won't forget me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Charles, I have flowers. 
we're going to be on the other side. We'll be on money. <laughs>